Hey there and welcome to SI Now. It's Wednesday, November 2nd, and I'm Ryan Aselta. Last night's final in Cleveland, 9-3, to three, and like that, we now have the two most powerful words in sports, Game 7. Standing room seats for tonight's matchup between Chicago and Cleveland are available on the resale market for $2,000 a piece and climbing. In fact, veteran catcher of the Cubs, David Ross, showed his entrepreneurial side saying, quote, can I sell mine? I'm going to be looking for a job after tomorrow. After a combined 176-year drought by the Cubs and Indians, what's one more day of waiting for relief and the title of champion? One drought ends tonight at Progressive Field. And some 350 miles away from Progressive Field is Wrigley Field. And fans already starting to pour into Wrigleyville. They want to be a part of what they hope is a celebration after Game 7 tonight over in Cleveland. And we welcome you in our Time Inc. studios. We're joined by Ted Keith, the SI senior editor, who's going to get us ready for Game 7, a big game. It doesn't get much bigger than this in Major League Baseball, Ted. Let's talk about pressure to start things off here. These guys, the Cubs, the Indians, they know what's on the line. 108 years, 68 years. Do you think one team's feeling more pressure going into tonight? You know, if I had to say, I'd almost in a way pick the Cubs because they, the, the oldest adage in baseball is that your momentum is only as good as your next day's starting pitcher. So the Cubs can feel great about hanging on to win game five. They can feel great about getting their bats going finally in game six. But they know that they got to face Corey Kluber and Andrew Miller and Cody Allen in this game and maybe Brian Shaw as well. Those guys in the entire World Series have given up two runs, and they're easily capable because of the rest that they're on for covering 27 outs and maybe more if need be. Who are the Cubs going to counter with there? Kyle Hendricks, who got lifted when he had a shutout going in the fifth inning the other night, and then who does Madden go to? He can't pitch a role as Chapman forever. At some point, he's got to trust somebody else in that bullpen. So, yeah, the Cubs have to be feeling good right now after what they did do, but I think the Indians have to be feeling really good about what they have the chance to do and who they're sending out to the mound to do it for them. Yeah, you mentioned the starters. It's Corey Kluber making his third start of the series against Kyle Hendricks. Uh, on the surface, you think the advantage immediately goes to Kluber, but let's face it, he's pitched a lot in this yeah. series so far, right? Well, he has, but a lot of on short rest, but not a lot of innings, not a lot of pitches, and that's one of the things that Terry Francona has done. We've talked a lot about how he's managed the bullpen when other guys have pitched, like Trevor Bauer and Josh Tomlin, but he's kind of done it when, when Kluber has pitched as well. Only 88 pitches his first time out, 81 his second time out. He hasn't gone deeper than six innings in any of those games. He's averaged six innings in his five postseason starts. So if he gets six innings with a lead to that bullpen, you're looking at Miller and Allen for potentially nine outs when they could – probably each get you nine outs all by themselves. So at the first sign of trouble anywhere in this ballgame tonight, especially if he has a lead, Terry Francona can make that move. So look, if Corey Kluber isn't on his game, you go to Miller as early as, what, third, fourth inning if you have to, you're not going to lose the game with any one of those guys as long as you have another option behind them. Some interesting, interesting decisions being made by Joe Madden last night. Mainly his bullpen, he goes to Araldis Chapman despite having a five-run lead that turned into a seven-run lead. We saw Chapman almost, it looked like he tweaked maybe his ankle and his knee covering first base. How big of an effect do you think that will have, having used him last night uh, on tonight, and, and how soon could Madden actually go to Chapman? You know, he's, Chapman says he's fine, but he says two things. He says, you know, tell me before the game that you might want to use me before the ninth inning, which we know they've already said. And don't get me up more than once. If I get up, I'm coming into the game. So that has to play into it for Joe Madden as well. If he thinks the spot for Chapman is coming in the seventh, you know, is he really prepared to get him up and try and close out the rest of the game after he threw 62 pitches in the last three days? It's not about, you know, getting him up in the seventh and then waiting to see, and then getting him back up in the eighth and then waiting to see. If Chapman wants to come in the game as soon as he gets warm, that's who you're living and dying with. Now, I don't know exactly what Pedro Strope did to anger Joe Madden so much or Hector Rondon, who was the closer before Madden, uh, before the Cubs got Chapman, but those guys have really fallen into disfavor. And Strope didn't do himself any favors last night either by giving up a run after he came in for Chapman, but um, or at least allowing an inherited runner to score. But nevertheless, uh, I, I wonder how much the Indians are going to fear Chapman at this point too. Yeah, the fastball will be there, but you can sit dead red. Any major league hitter can. And if that 100-mile-an-hour fastball is now 98, that makes a huge difference. So it's about, for the Indians, it's about keeping the game close and then getting into the Chicago bullpen before Chapman and maybe trying to win the game there because Madden can't go to him in the fifth or the sixth inning. Pretty interesting. A lot of uh, skeptics on the decision to bring him in. One of them was one of the Cubs' 
uh, John Lackey, who was very, very skeptical in his manager's decision after last night's game. Take a listen to this. Were you surprised to see a roll in as early as he was with that score? Yes, very. <laughs> Happy you got out of it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just, hopefully he's uh, feeling good for tomorrow. Available for tomorrow, I would assume? Yeah. So Ted Lackey was surprised. How surprised with you? I guess not that he went to him at all, but he stuck with him. Madden, yeah. after the game, kept alluding to his other relievers couldn't get ready in time. No, I didn't buy, buy that? that. No, not at all. I mean, look, first of all, part of the job of managing, it, one of the biggest jobs maybe is your bullpen, and that goes to not just knowing who you have that you can use, but who you need to get ready to use. So you're constantly looking at the lineup and saying, if this guy comes up, that's who we're going to use, or the pitcher spot if it were National League Park is coming up here, so how do we you know, maneuver around that? So the idea that you know, they didn't have a backup plan had Anthony Rizzo not hit that two-run homer that it was just Chapman or Bust for the, re for the rest of the game. Uh, yeah, that does surprise me a little bit. But look, I don't fault the strategy that managers have used this entire postseason, which is when you have a game, grab it and go for it. I mean, this is not an entirely new strategy. This is what baseball used to be like, you know, as, as far back in the 40s and 50s. If you were going to go to your bullpen at all, it might be really early in the game and then get some serious length out of guys. So... It's more now about saying, where's the highest leverage spot and what can I do? But if you're trying to combine that with saying the highest leverage spot might be in the sixth or the seventh, and by the way, I also want you to finish the game, that's a big ask for guys that aren't used to doing it. No doubt there'll be some kind of ramifications, but let's face it, this is a game seven. You could yeah. see all sorts of pitches in this game. Maybe John Lester yep. could be the guy closing this game tonight. Yeah, I could see him coming in. I mean, I, I think you have to be careful about a couple of things. One is if you bring him in, you got to bring David Ross in. And, you know, Ross has a little bit of pop in his bat, and he's shown a good arm at times this year thanks to the, the tagging skills of Javier Baez. But uh, that's, that's a downgrade if you, you can't go to Wilson Contreras, and that would be your third and final catcher in all likelihood if you pinch it with Miguel Montero somewhere else in the game. Um, you know, Kyle Schwarber has caught before, but I seriously doubt they're letting him do any catching tonight. Um, so that's a multiple-player move. And then with Lester, you got to worry about if anybody gets on base. You know, he can't make that throw over. He's unwilling to make that throw over. So any walk, any single almost automatically becomes a double unless Ross can throw him out. And that's a guy in scoring position. So a lot of things to consider. I think Jake Arrieta could be available in this game. He threw 102 mm -hmm. pitches last night. Look for him to, to get some action if he needs to. And the entire Indians bullpen, including Josh Tomlin, I don't know how much faith Terry Francona would have in him. But if this game goes you know, extra innings, it's going to be decided probably by starting pitchers coming on rather than traditional relievers. All hands on deck for Game 7. And uh, the Cubs offense, well, they finally came to life last night. Addison Russell tied a World Series record with six RBIs in Game 6. He earns our adrenaline performance presented by Toyota. Let's go places. And Russell's Grand Slam was the first in Cubs World Series history. And the 21-year-old became the youngest player since Mickey Mantle in 1953 to hit a Grand Slam in the World Series. Ted, we'll wrap this up. Everyone knows what's on the line with so much history on the line here. Safe to say this is maybe the most important Game 7 in baseball history? Yeah, it's an interesting discussion. I mean, I, I think that baseball has a real moment here, not just tonight, but throughout this postseason. NFL ratings are coming down. Football is something of a crossroads anyway. Uh, baseball has a new regime in place in Commissioner Rob Manford, who's talking about willing to do things that would carry baseball forward for future generations. There's a lot of young talent in the game. There's going to be a lot of people watching tonight. I'm going to guess somewhere around 30 million people to be the highest uh, rating for a broadcast game in a uh, baseball game in decades. People need to see that this sport is great. Now, on the other hand, if the Cubs win, baseball doesn't have that to fall back on anymore. They can't say the, oh, tune in because you might see the Cubs finally win a World Series. Baseball has to be able to keep growing the sport, and, and a spotlight like this tonight where everybody in the country is going to be watching and paying attention is the best way to sell baseball for the dramatic spectacle that it is. It has more action in the game than a football game. People don't realize that. It, it's shorter a lot of times in a football game. So this is a moment, and baseball can't let it get away. No, and uh, you mentioned a lot of eyeballs on TV. Yeah. Fans already pouring into the bars in Chicago and Cleveland. I know we'll be watching. Enjoy the game tonight. Ted Keith, thanks for being with us. Thank you.
Well, while much of America is rooting for the Cubs to end their 108-year World Series drought, our next guest is openly rooting against Chicago. He's a born and bred St. Louis Cardinals fan and is one of the best-selling rap artists of all time. Nelly joins us on SI Now. And uh, Nelly, you got the St. Louis Cardinals cap going today. Uh, how yeah, are you feeling about this Game 7 tonight with the Cubs and a World Series title on the line? You know what? Um, today might be the best day in the worst day of my life at this point. Um, it's actually my birthday, November the 2nd, but I would hate to be November the 2nd to be remembered as the day the Cubs won their first World Series, and I don't know how, how long. Um, I might forget being 42 for the rest of my life. I might want to wipe that out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, I got I got one game left, man. I got one life left, and hopefully um, the Cleveland can pull it out for me. Yeah, man. Happy birthday. What's the plan tonight? Thank Where you. are you going to celebrate? Where are you going to be watching Game 7? Uh, I'm working. I'm working. I'm actually going to <laughs> get back in the studio. I'm actually waiting till this weekend. I will be celebrating out in Vegas. So if anybody wants to come out, make sure you come out this weekend. We're going to celebrate, do it up real big at Dre's in Vegas. So um, we're going to have a lot of fun. And uh, your new job, you're a contributor yeah. on Undisputed with uh, Skip and Shannon, which can be seen yeah. on FS1. You said last night on the show that the Indians were going to close things out in game six. I was hoping. <laughs> I was hoping. Listen, I know I you're right hoping for I knew somebody tonight. was going to jump out early. I just, didn't, <laughs> I just didn't know it was the other way around. And it's so funny because after the, after the first home run, I really wasn't that concerned because I was like, okay, well, it's just one swing. You know, that can happen. Um, that doesn't determine the rest of the, you know, the rest of the game as far as how the pitcher conducts himself. You know, anybody just made a mistake. But when that ball landed in the outfield in between um, both of those guys, you, you just knew it was like, oh, there it is. Here it is. I would have rather seen them knock each other over trying to get the ball as opposed to being too timid. You know what I mean? So that was kind of a sign to me. I just went back into the booth. <laughs> <laughs> what mistakes are you hoping to see tonight on the baseball field? Well, no mistakes, per se. I, I just, um, I'm hoping that, you know, they, they kind of pull it off. My prediction is like 3-1. So, I'm hoping Clover, um, I hope he pitches his ass off, basically. I, <laughs> you know, I'm basically hoping he pitches the game of his freaking life for me and every Cardinals fan back home in St. Louis. I'm looking for Bartman dolls. I'm looking for black cats. I'm looking for anything that can, that can help this Help this be a party for St. Louis and Cleveland. You're not telling me you have a pet billy goat at home, are you? No, no, no. I ain't too cool with the goats, bro. We don't got goats in the hood. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but we got plenty of stray cats. I can find a couple of them. All right. Well, along with uh, being a big baseball fan, you're also co-owner of the NBA's Charlotte Hornets. Team's off to a 2-1 and one start. Uh, when you look at this team, what do you like most about this young group of Hornets this year? Just the grittiness, just the grittiness and the work ethic of the team. You know what I mean? Just um, that's all you want right now. It's, you know, still a very young team, um, but definitely headed in the right direction. Um, <clears throat> you just want, you just, you know, you just want them to continuously play with that effort. You just want them to give effort every night, and I think effort to take you a long way, um, definitely in this league. So, you know, we have great point guard in Kimba, and and <clears throat> so, you know, I think he's, um, I think he's might get. I'm going to say it. Kimba for MVP. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Another prediction by Nelly right here on SI now. I like it. I like well, I, it. I'm reaching with that one, but I, I, you know, who knows? <laughs> hey, uh, in the Hornets home opener, uh, a video was played urging peace and unity after some of the recent uh, police protests. Now, you've commented on Colin Kaepernick and his national anthem mm -hmm. protests. As, as co-owner of a team, how important is it for you to address some of the social issues in sports? Well, I think it's, I think it's important <clears throat> in a sense of letting people know you understand what they're feeling in tough times, regardless of who you are, what you own, what you do, because we're all still on the same planet. We're all still as one. You know, if this planet goes, it doesn't matter who's got what money. We're all going together. You know what I'm saying? And I think it's very important just to let people know, yo, we understand, um, and we're here to help by, you know, different ways. Everybody helps in their own different way. But just to let people know that, yo, we, we got to do it together. All right. I know you got a busy day and night ahead of you. Can catch Nelly as the newest contributor on Undisputed with Skip Bayless, Shannon Sharp, yes, and Joy Taylor. That airs daily at 9.30 a.m. Eastern 
on FS1. Nelly, thanks for being with us. And from all of us here at SI Now, happy birthday, man. Thank you, thank you. Go Cleveland! <laughs>
Uh, you have to come out after the game and talk at the press conferences like everyone else. No one likes to talk after a loss, period. Uh, but if you're walking off, you're not celebrating anymore, then yes, the game becomes not fun when you lose. Now, a couple calls has been questionable um, about whether they should have been flagged or guys should have got fines or whatever it is. You have to understand you are Cam Newton, um, and you are just as you know capable of anyone else on the offensive side of the ball at running over a defensive player. Um, and that's not giving others a pass, but at the same time, we've seen him do it so many times that he's just not going to get the same calls as a Tom Brady. He's not going to get the same calls as a Drew Brees because they don't run as much and they're not as big and physical as these guys. And you look, one guy normally is not bringing down Cam Newton. Right. That's just no, normally not the case. And in this case, you know, he's not going to get those calls because he's just he's physically able to do certain things that other quarterbacks is not. So he has to be in a position to kind of stop whining a little bit, give that part of it up and understand that these calls are not going to go your way. And I think once you stop whining and stop complaining about it, they you know, ultimately will. When you hear a quarterback complaining like that, if you're going up against him next week, you going after him? Yeah, I'm going to give him something to complain about. You know, yeah, I want to. And, and knowing that you have someone that, that's going to complain that way, you know, it's really easy to get up under their skin. When things are not going well, you want to lay on guys a little bit after a pile. You want to, you know, get in the guy's face a little bit because you already know that, that mentally he's already frustrated from not getting these calls in the previous weeks. Um, and it's not going to help his case by keeping complaining to the ref. So, of course, as a defensive player, your main job and, and, and focus is to get on these guys' skin. If you don't do it, you wouldn't be a defensive player. All right. Uh, since you've retired, you've been a busy man. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about getting into MMA post-football. I know uh, you've paired up with Bellator yeah. uh, off the field on some business side of things. How close were you? To step in into the ring? Uh, super close. Um, I got actually offered a couple fights right when I retired. The only reason why I didn't is because I started to do some TV work and I started to really get behind my company Lights Out. Um, and I really fell in love with the apparel space. Um, and then when you get a chance to make partnerships like Bellator, who is just up and coming, you see guys leaving other leagues and going to Bellator all the time. They actually have a huge event, Bellator 163, coming up this Friday on Spike TV. Uh, I'll be there at the fight. And so to have that partnership with my apparel company, with Lights Out, along with Bellator, it gave me an opportunity to build a brand within a brand. So, you know, something you can go work out in, but also you can wear it after you're, you know, you're done at the gym before you go up and have uh, meetings at Starbucks or conference calls walking up the street and you don't want to look out of place, but you still want to look classy and comfortable. We, we hope to just keep making this thing bigger. You know, we have a bunch of huge fights coming up. And right. then again, Bellator 163 this Friday is going to be amazing. Very cool. The, the apparel space, a little safer post-retirement plan than MMA, I guess. Yeah, but it's a, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a headache. It's a headache. Both of them are headaches, I tell you. <laughs> Sean Merriman, thanks for being with us. Thanks man. for having me. All right, and that's going to do it for this Wednesday edition of SI Now. Tomorrow, Maggie will be back to wrap up the World Series. We're going to have a new champion in Major League Baseball. That's at 1 p.m. Eastern. Until then, you can keep up with all the latest news on SI.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at SI Now Live. Have a great day and enjoy. Game 7.